um, officially welcome. My name is Adara Goldberg, and I am the director here at the Holocaust Resource Center of Kane University. It is our pleasure to welcome our colleague and friend, Dr. Rebecca Lerbelding, to present on Josiah Du Bois and American Responses to the Holocaust. Um, today's program is made part made possible through the Union County Office of Cultural and Heritage Affairs, who granted us a 2023 special project grant um, to conduct more work with our Du Bois archives. Um, as your Dr. Belding will be able to tell you about the man. And what I can tell you when we're done is that there is a fairly outstanding collection um, right here at the Holocaust Resource Center on site that was donated to us two years ago. Um, really out of nowhere, um, it was the missing pieces of his personal collection. And so that's something that any you know, students or researchers that are interested in delving in, um, please feel free you know, to reach out and I'm happy to provide more information. Um, but for now, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Belding to get us started. Yeah, thank you so much, Adara. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, as Adara said, my name is Becky Belding. I am a historian. Um, my day job is as a historian at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., but a lot of my work on American response and on Josiah Du Bois uh, specifically is done in my own personal capacity. I have a Ph.D. in history, and my doctoral dissertation was on the War Refugee Board, which we'll talk about uh, and Du Bois was absolutely critical in the foundation and the founding of the War Refugee Board and in some of the most important projects that they ran. Um, he is kind of a man, a myth, and a legend. And I'll talk a little bit about who he was, some of the myths surrounding him, because there actually are some. Um, and then a little bit about how he's been and is being commemorated. Um, so to kind of get started, I think we do need to cover a little bit about American response generally, um, before Du Bois comes into the picture. I think there is a collective memory of American response that we kind of have as Americans of this narrative, unchanging arc of anti-Semitism and indifference, this idea that the United States didn't know anything about what was happening, and if they had, they wouldn't have done anything about it, or they knew everything about what was happening and uh, didn't do anything about it. And the establishment of the War Refugee Board in January 1944, which Du Bois, of course, was, was a pivotal part of, um, is a huge turn in the narrative. Um, American response fundamentally changes in that moment in January 1944. And so by forgetting about him, by forgetting about the War Refugee Board generally, or by making it just the afterword of a book, um, we lose the ability to learn from what they did and who they were. So the United States in the 1930s and 1940s, a lot of the responses that Americans had to the Holocaust really came back to the 1920s. There are new immigration laws first in 1921 and then in 1924 that fundamentally change how immigration worked. Um, suddenly there were limits on the number of people who could come, limits based in the false science of eugenics, and the United States had no refugee policy, and that lasts through the war. So even though we talk about Jewish refugees from the Holocaust, there's no legal um, kind of definition of who that is, and there are no legal protections for refugees, not for refugees, not for asylum seekers, not for migrants. There were only immigrants and non-immigrants. So immigrant, you could come as an immigrant and fill out all of this paperwork, or you could come as a tourist and fill out also a lot of paperwork, just a little less. Um, so when Hitler is appointed chancellor in January 1933, there is quite a lot of news coverage in the United States about this new leader in Germany, about the boycott of Jewish owned businesses in April 1933, about um, Jews being kicked out of the civil service, about Jewish, hang on, my slideshow is not progressing, there we go. Um, about uh, book burning. So this is the New York, the New York Star Eagle. Um, this is Saturday, uh, April 1st, 1933. You can see that the major headline is Nazis enforce boycott edict, guards picket closed shops. Um, as I said, this was headline news throughout the United States. So even on top of the beginning of the Roosevelt administration 
and the New Deal. And you can see just under the boycott headline that prohibition is ending. So there's a lot of big things going on. But throughout the spring of 1933, one of the biggest stories is what was happening in Germany. And we know that Americans are paying attention to this because there's a massive protest movement um, in response to what the Nazis are doing. So this is uh, a petition that was sent to the State Department from the citizens of Bayonne, New Jersey. And they say that they are assembling on the 27th day of March at the junior high school um, because, and you can see on the right, we've learned from unquestionable authentic sources of the many outrages perpetuated by the National Socialists of Germany against Jews and other minorities of the unwarranted invasion of peaceful homes, of the desecration of synagogues and cemeteries, of brutal physical assaults, murder and looting, of illegal arrests and tortures, and of the circulation of vicious libels designed to poison the minds of the ignorant. So this is March 28th, 1933. Hitler has been in power in Germany for less than two months. And enough is out there about what is happening, um, that there's a massive protest about it. And they say that they're assembling at the junior high school and they unanimously and without regard to racial, religious or political affi affiliation, voice their indignant protest against the vicious acts and sinister designs of the German government towards Jews and other minorities in its midst. And so what you see is that you see this massive protest movement, but you don't see a major government response to it. The Roosevelt administration ultimately decides not to do any sort of formal protest against what the Nazis are doing. And after book burning in May 1933, there aren't these visible um, things that reporters and photographers in Germany can document. And so you don't see um, a lot of protest after that. The, the story starts to fall away from the headlines and therefore, Americans stop paying attention. They're, they're paying more attention to the New Deal and the end of the Great Depression or the attempted end of the Great Depression. You know, in 1933, as all of this is happening, 25% of the American workforce is, is unemployed. And so there are a lot of really um, serious domestic matters um, that Americans are dealing with, and they turn away from paying attention to what is happening to Jews in Germany. They start to paying attention again um, with Kristallnacht, um, the Night of Broken Glass, the so-called Night of Broken Glass or the November Pogrom in November 1938. And you can see here again, the New York, the New York Star Eagle um, right after Kristallnacht that the main headline is Nazis attack Jews and burn temples. Um, Kristallnacht happened just a day after the midterm elections. And you can see that the bigger headline is Kristallnacht and not the, you know, on the left, you see Republican sweep is hailed as trend towards 1940 victory. Um, Roosevelt, who is at this point, basically a lame duck, nobody expects him to run for an unprecedented third term in 1940. Um, he really is, um, again, making a decision. And he ultimately decides that the US is going to condemn what is happening, but it's not going to change its immigration laws. Uh, to deal with the issue. And part of that is because the American people don't want that. Um, when they're protesting in the streets in 1933, they're protesting for it to stop over there in Germany. But then by 1938, it's clear that, that Jews are not safe in Germany and German controlled territories, and that the real thing that needs to happen is to get them out. And that is something that Americans are not willing to be part of that solution. So you see um, these two polls in November 1938. So do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? 94% of those those polled just weeks after Kristallnacht say that they disapprove of what the Nazis are doing. And then the same people are asked, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles to come to the US to live? And 72% say no. So thoughts and prayers, we're very sorry about what's happening, but we don't want to be part of the solution. And you see this reflected not just because the um, people trying to escape are Jewish, though that's part of it. It's not just a general nativism, though that's part of it too. There's also a lot of American isolationism. Uh, after World War I, um, America decided seem seemingly on a bipartisan basis that we do better on our side of the Atlantic and the Pacific and that we're not going to get involved in foreign wars anymore. 
Uh, this is an article from The Reflector, which is published by the, Stuart, the students of the New York State Teachers College at Newark, which is now Kane University. Um, and it says, students taboo aid for Europe. This is December, 1939. And of the um, 168 people chosen at random from the student body, only 35 thought that the United States should assist the democracies. So in this case, they mean Great Britain and France um, who are at this point at war with Nazi Germany. And 133 voted no on that. And you can see um, some of the student opinions. One says, yes, we are too closely tied to the democracies in our international relations. And another says, keep out of war, we have enough trouble here. Um, but three quarters of students uh, at what is now Kane in 1939 are not interested in getting involved in the war. That doesn't mean that the refugee crisis hasn't continued. Um, when you, uh, the U.S. finally does go to war, it takes a really uncomfortably long time for Americans to understand that the Holocaust is happening. Um, they learn about it in really the fall of 1942 as a message comes out of Switzerland, gets to the State Department, gets to Rabbi Stephen Wise, and then finally um, gets into American newspapers. So this seems really obvious to us now, the idea that Jews are being murdered en masse and that the Nazis have this plan. And it seems kind of ridiculous that Americans haven't realized it, in part because you see all of the lead up, you see the hate speech, you see the attacks on Jews and Jewish bodies. Um, but when Europe goes to war, American reporters largely leave. And what that means is that there aren't these firsthand accounts you get stories of uh, communities being wiped out in East, particularly in Eastern Europe, in the, the Soviet territories after the summer of 1941. But the articles begin with something like the Polish government in exile reports that or the Soviet government reports that. And those are sources that Americans don't trust. They're very willing to chalk that up to propaganda. This idea that those are groups that want America to get involved in the war. And so it takes a very long time. Um, until November 1942 for this to be something that Americans understand. Uh, Josiah Du Bois is about to enter our story, I promise. Um, for more than a year after this, there's more and more information coming out and more and more pressure on the U.S. government to do something. This is pressure that the State Department is consistently trying to tamp down. Um, in early November 1943, uh, some activists who had been pushing the U.S. for a more robust response convinced their supporters in Congress to um, support what it, they called the Rescue Resolution. It was a resolution, um, non-binding, but calling on Roosevelt to appoint some sort of commission to study the problem of what is happening with Jews and to make recommendations. Um, so it, it was just the formation of a committee. And the House of Representatives uh, their Committee on Foreign Affairs holds hearings about this. They hold five days of hearings. And right after Thanksgiving, the Friday after Thanksgiving in 1943, the man that you see on the left here, Breckenridge Long, who was the Assistant Secretary of State, uh, testifies in these hearings in a closed session. And he says that we don't need this committee. Um, we have been doing just fine. Uh, Long was the head of the visa division, which was in charge of all matters for whatever they called refugees. Um, so people being persecuted. And he says, we've been doing a great job on behalf of the refugees. You, you just don't know because the State Department has been keeping it secret. And he spends several hours telling Congress what a good job they've been doing. And his testimony goes so well. He's so convincing to all of the congressmen and the House committee in this closed session that he decides that he can make the activists stop that maybe people will stop pressuring the government if they know all of these secret things that the State Department is doing. And so he unilaterally prints his own testimony and sends it out to the press. And as you can see on the right, he's immediately called out for lying to Congress. Um, he had claimed in his testimony that the United States had accepted 580,000 refugees fleeing Nazism. Um, this was actually a, a number that he had used multiple times over the past year and nobody had called him out on it. But suddenly when he is testifying in front of Congress and using this number and, and trying to damn the idea of this committee, um, congressmen, other congressmen notice. 
and the the number 580,000 is is kind of picked out of a hat. It's the total number of immigrants that the United States had taken in since 1933, not remotely the number of people fleeing the Nazis. And so immediately Long is in a very vulnerable position. And across the White House lawn, you can see the White House here. Um, on the right, the very big building with the columns is the Department of the Treasury. And on the left, the very ornate building there, which is now the um, Eisenhower office building, was the State Department. So the White House is right between the Treasury Department and the State Department. And a group of Treasury Department lawyers start plotting. Um, they had been in charge for a long time of the U.S. sanctions program. Um, World War II is also the first time the U.S. had any sort of real sanctions program. And this group of fairly young Treasury Department lawyers are in charge of the program and in charge of um, what they decide in 1943 is choosing and allowing small amounts of humanitarian aid through the sanctions to get to um, Jewish communities in Europe, what they hoped would, would happen. And consistently, the State Department is trying to stop those cables from coming or the, that money from going. And they keep telling the Treasury Department, no, we will send the cable. And then they find out two weeks later, the Treasury Department finds out that they didn't send the cable. No, no, we'll, we'll do it right now. And they don't do it. All they want to do, all Treasury wants to do is send $25,000 to Romania, to Switzerland, to be distributed in Romania and France. This is not a ton of money. And the Treasury, the State Department keeps throwing up barriers to this, and they can't figure out why. The, so enter Josiah Dubois. Um, by December 1943, it had been seven months since the Treasury Department first approved the $25,000. And Josiah Dubois, who was a 31-year-old lawyer from Camden, New Jersey, um, was in charge of investigating the State Department's excuses. Uh, du Bois was the oldest of a very large um, family. He was a prodigy. He had graduated from high school at the age of 14. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania at 18 and the law school at 21. Uh, he joined the Treasury Department in 1936, uh, briefly left to start a law firm with one of his brothers. But in January 1941, as it became clear that the United States was going to get involved in the war, he's really invited back to Washington to come back to the Treasury Department and to work with the same sanctions people that he um, had met in the late 1930s. Um, at this point, at age 31, he had four younger brothers who were all in the U.S. military, and he had just found out in the fall of 1943 that his younger brother, Louis, had been shot down over Germany. Uh, Louis was in a German POW camp. He survived, but this entire time, Du Bois knows that his brother is in German hands. He is picked for this role to investigate the State Department, in part because I think he is the clearest with words of any of the Treasury Department people, and he is not willing to mince any of them. Um, so while trying to figure out why the State Department has been delaying this aid, Du Bois turns to a guy that he carpools with. Um, again, this is D.C. during the war, and so tires and gas were all rationed. And Du Bois, who lived in Silver Spring, Maryland, had a carpool buddy named Donald Hiss. Um, if you recognize that name, Donald Hiss was the brother of Alger Hiss, the future Soviet spy. So Donald Hiss and, and um, Du Bois are carpool buddies. And one day uh, in a Saturday morning in December 1943, when they think that the State Department might not be as busy, um, Hiss, who works at the State Department, sneaks Du Bois into his office and sets Du Bois loose in the State Department file room. Um, and in the file room, Du Bois discovers that not only had the State Department been delaying all of this humanitarian aid, Again, seemingly for no reason that is discernible to Du Bois, but that earlier in the year, Assistant Secretary of State Breckinridge Long, who is the same man who's just been called out for lying to Congress that same month, um, that Long had personally instructed U.S. diplomats in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States, that it was getting out to the activists. And just like in his testimony, Long had figured if the American people don't know about what's happening, or think that we're doing a good job, they'll stop pressuring the government to do more. 
I've always said that one of the best things about um, researching the, the Treasury Department is that Henry Morgenthau Jr. was FDR's Treasury Secretary. Uh, he was not particularly good with money. Um, he had never graduated college, but he was a fantastic administrator and he was a great record keeper. Um, a lot of what we know about the um, the government during the war comes from the so-called Morgenthau Diaries, which are basically every piece of paper that ever crossed his desk and crucially uh, transcripts of all his meetings. And so this is from um, one of the meetings that they had in December 1943, right after Du Bois has gotten back from the State Department. He says to Morgenthau, Mr. Secretary, the only question we have in our mind, I think, is the bull has to be taken by the horns in dealing with this Jewish issue and get this thing out of the State Department into some agency's hands that's willing to deal with it frontally. For instance, take the complaint, what are we going to do with the Jews? We let them die because we don't know what to do about them or what to do with them. And then Randolph Paul, who's the Treasury Department's general counsel, says, we are speaking as citizens now. And so the Treasury staff begins working. Um, they first start uh, preparing a massive memo to Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, really laying out all of the things that his government had been doing. There's a story that goes around, and this is one of the myths, um, there's a story that goes around about Josiah Du Bois that his wife said after he died that he had given up Christmas with his family. He had, you know, opened presents and then went into his office and wrote all day. And the thing that came out of that is a, is a memo called the acquiescence of this government in the murder of the Jews of Europe. That is actually not true. Not the part about Christmas. I'm sure he did work um, on Christmas day because once the treasury department staff decided that they were going to take this on, um, they all go full force on it. And, and Du Bois is the first person who writes the first draft of what becomes many of these memos. But drafts that have come out, um, that have that have come out in the archives have shown that as of January 20, or uh, I'm sorry, as of December 25th, they are still trying to put together this Hull memo. And so while Du Bois probably does work all day on Christmas Day. He's preparing a much earlier memo that over the next couple of weeks will become the memo that is officially titled on the acquiescence of this government in the murder of the Jews of Europe, which I'll show you in a second. This is from Kane's files. Um, Adara was nice enough to allow me to come up and see it, see the collection as soon as it came in. And you can see here um, a memo that from the corner, you can see that Josiah Du Bois is the original author of this. And this is January 6th, 1944, telling Morgenthau that we are working hard on gathering all of the shocking facts that have come to our attention and that they will submit a full report in the early part of next week. And that's what they do. Um, January 12th, 1944, they give a memo to um, Secretary Morgenthau and they have a really long meeting in his office this is one of the later drafts of the memo that they present to him. Um, you can see that it is called personal report to the president on the acquiescence of this government in the murder of the Jewish population in Europe. And you can see that just from the language and the fact that it's in blue and Du Bois really liked to print in blue, um, the memo begins, one of the greatest crimes in history, the slaughter of the Jewish people in Europe is continuing unabated unless remedial steps of a drastic nature are taken and taken immediately, I am certain that no effective action will be taken by this government to prevent the complete extermination of the Jews in German controlled Europe, and that this government will have to share for all time responsibility for this extermination. And Du Bois ended the memo by quoting Emanuel Seller, who was one of the um, congressmen who was criticizing Breckenridge Long. And he says, if men of the temperament and philosophy of Long continue in control of immigration administration, we may as well take down the plaque from the Statue of Liberty and black out the lamp beside the golden door. This is a very strongly written memo. Um, he basically says, I leave it up to you first, Mr. Secretary, and then when they start to rework the memo for the president, I leave it up to you as to whether the State Department are war criminals in every sense of the word. Um, but they make it clear that this cannot stand and that the United States needs to do more. 
And so on January 16th, 1944, Morgenthau and two members of his staff, not Du Bois, but Randolph Paul and John Paley, um, go to the White House and they meet with Roosevelt and they convince him to take so-called refugee matters out of the hands of the State Department, which is clearly not doing anything to help, and create a new government agency called the War Refugee Board. Um, this fundamentally changes U.S. response to the Holocaust overnight. Um, the board is officially headed by the heads of state, uh, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, and the Secretary of the Treasury, but it is almost entirely a Treasury Department operation. It is headed by John Paley, who was the um, head of the U.S. sanctions program, a 35-year-old assistant secretary, and Du Bois comes on as the War Refugee Board's general counsel. And so for the first time, the, the U.S. has a policy about the Holocaust. And by the time the war in Europe ends 17 months later, the agency has clearly saved tens of thousands of lives and helped hundreds of thousands of people. I'll do a really quick kind of once over of, of what they're doing. And then I want to focus on one story where Du Bois is really the mastermind bef behind um, one of the most public things that the War Refugee Board does. Um, they try a lot of different things in, in different countries. Um, you can see here, this is a photo from March 1944. Um, Paley is on the right side of the screen and Du Bois is in the middle there. Um, first, it's, it's really crucial to remember that in, by 1944, the Allies are winning the war. And so the prospect of this future Allied victory meant that the United States suddenly had leverage over other countries, um, particularly the neutral nations, which had been playing both sides throughout the war. So Switzerland, Sweden, Spain, Portugal, Turkey, um, the U.S. could ask things of these countries now. And those countries had to take the, you know, the requests of an emerging superpower seriously. So the first thing that they decide to do um, that Paley and Du Bois and the rest of the, the War Refugee Board staff decide to do on the, the same day that Roosevelt um, creates the agency is they amend how humanitarian aid gets to Europe. No longer does it have to go through the State Department. It goes from being a project that can take seven months and then still not get approved to something that takes about a week and a very short form. And so by the end of the war, the War Refugee Board has authorized about $11 million in humanitarian aid, which is about $160 million today, um, to a whole host of different aid agencies. And that is used to buy guns for the French underground, food for children in hiding. Um, it's used to create false papers. Um, it's used to pay off border guards to help people escape into territories that are considered safer. And so the main thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to keep people alive inside Europe for as long as possible. If they're deep inside Nazi territory, they're trying to propaganda warfare to convince the Nazis to stop the killing. And they're trying to move people who are on the margins of Nazi territory into areas where they're going to be safer. Um, so for the propaganda warfare component, they get a whole host of different um, celebrities. I mean, honestly, celebrities um, Catholic uh, archbishops and uh, politicians and all sorts of people to issue statements that they then send, drop by leaflet or send via radio into Nazi territory. Um, these statements condemning the murders, um, Roosevelt's statement promising post-war punishment. Um, Roosevelt's statement was drafted by Josiah Du Bois and actually begins the exact same way that um, the, the acquiescence memo did, basically. Um, in one of the blackest crimes of all history begun by the Nazis in the day of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. And so that message and the condemnation that, um, that followed, specifically calling out in part Hungary as a new area in which the Nazis, the Nazis had just occupied Hungary when this Roosevelt statement goes out. And the War Refugee Board writes the statement specifically to say, you Hungarians who have not been part of this before, why would you become a war criminal now? Um, to take action, as I said, with people who could still be saved, they needed partners, the War Refugee Board needed partners. And so they placed um, aid workers or treasury staff in the neutral nations 
uh, to put pressure on those nations to do more, to pass on intelligence, to protest what the Nazis are doing, um, and to allow more Jews over their borders. And so um, the War Refugee Board really thought if, if more neutral countries would put representatives in Hungary, for example, um, that could serve as a deterrent to violence and a deterrent to deportations. Uh, we now know that what happened in, in Hungary happened so quickly. Um, about 437,000 uh, people deported mainly from the countryside in Hungary to Auschwitz in a span of 55 days, that the War Refugee Board is not as effective as it probably, um, as one would hope it could be in a place like Hungary. But the War Refugee Board does manage to put someone uh, in Hungary, and that someone is Raoul Wallenberg, the now famous Swedish businessman. Um, when the War Refugee Board asks all of these neutral nations to send representatives, Sweden is the country that says yes, and they offer, you know, who do you want to send? And the War Refugee Board's representative in Stockholm, Ivor Olsen, um, has met Raoul Wallenberg, knows that Wallenberg has ties already in Hungary. And so Wallenberg gets to um, Budapest in July, starts distributing relief. The deportations have already stopped. And in October 1944, he thinks he's going to go home um, and starts to make plans to go home when a fascist group takes over Hungary. And immediately the Jews of Budapest are once again in danger. Um, they mandate the use of the yellow star again, and then Jews begin to disappear from Budapest. And so Wallenberg tries to save as many lives as possible, issuing protective papers, opening safe houses. He and the other neutral diplomats who are in um, Budapest save tens of thousands of lives during this period. Um, and we know now that in January 1945, Wallenberg is arrested by the Soviets as they are coming in and liberating uh, Budapest. And eventually they send him to Moscow where he's most likely executed um, in 1947 at the age of 35. Beyond Wallenberg, beyond the, the uh, humanitarian aid, beyond all of the propaganda stuff, um, the War Refugee Board starts ransom negotiations with the Nazis. This is uh, Roswell McClelland, the board's representative in Switzerland. Um, they in Switzerland, they're trying to use kind of the Nazis' newfound interest in, um, or the, the Nazis are trying to use America's newfound interest in the fate of the Jews um, to kind of offer Jews for sale. And so McClelland, who you see here, and Sally Meyer, who is the, the Joints representative in Switzerland, managed to string along a group of high-ranking Nazis for about seven months saying that the U.S. will pay ransom, we will provide trucks, we will provide medical supplies, we will provide all of these things in exchange for you keeping Jews alive. Um, and they managed to get about uh, 1,600 Jews out of Bergen-Belsen as a good faith gesture on the part of the Nazis for carrying on these negotiations. Um, they send food packages, about 300,000 of them, into concentration camps and um, to people who are on forced marches in the end of the war. They pass along requests to the War Department to bomb the rail lines leading to Auschwitz and the crematorium. They give Americans detailed information for the first time in November 1944 on the process of arrival and selection and gassing at Auschwitz. And in response to this news that people are being murdered by poison gas, um, and the details that are in this, this quite lengthy and, and gruesome report, um, the Washington Post publishes an editorial entitled Genocide, which is the first time that word is used in an American newspaper. The thing that Du Bois is really instrumental in um, is not so much these. You know, he participates in the propaganda, in writing some of the propaganda messages, but for after the first couple of months of the War Refugee Board, he's really needed elsewhere. Um, he gets involved in the planning for post-war Germany. Um, he gets involved even ghost writing Morgenthau's book on the Morgenthau Plan, what became known as the Morgenthau Plan. But the thing that, that Du Bois, once the War Refugee Board is created, the thing that he really can get a lot of credit for is the establishment of the refugee camp at Fort Ontario. 
Um, this was one of many suggestions that was uh, repeated by different humanitarian groups after the War Refugee Board's creation. This idea that the United States, if we're going to ask other countries to take refugees, we need to take more ourselves. We need to create or encourage havens. And so in March 1944, Du Bois and one of his colleagues, Joseph Friedman, they collaborate on this memo. And you can see part of the memo here. They're arguing that we can't be hypocrites. Um, they write, the enemy must not be given the pretense of justification that the allies, while speaking in horrified terms of the Nazi treatment of Jews, never once offered to receive these people if the Nazis released them, or if the Germans released to them. The moral aspect of the problem is preeminent, and we should leave no stone unturned to make that issue clear. And so 1944, of course, is an election year, and the War Refugee Board knew, Du Bois knew, that they would have to convince Roosevelt that the idea would help him and not hurt him. And so they propose, I mean, Du Bois wants, and he says this at the time, he wants camps throughout the United States. He wants to bring hundreds of thousands of people. He wants to bring anybody the Nazis will release to the United States, keep them here, send them back after the war, that's fine, but keep them here and keep them safe. And they say, you know, we have thousands of German POWs here who are working on farms, who are in POW camps. Why can't we, if we're going to bring our enemy, why can't we bring our friend? Um, they said that these people will enter outside of the immigration quotas. They will return to Europe after the war. So the War Refugee Board really begins a propaganda campaign in the United States, trying to get the American people on board with this so that they could then point to Roosevelt and say, look, look, the American people want this. Um, they got Samuel Grafton, who was a syndicated columnist, uh, to devote a series of columns beginning in early April 1944 to this proposal. Um, John Paley had a dinner with Grafton a few weeks before Grafton starts writing these columns. And the language echoes so closely to what the War Refugee Board is saying that I don't think it's a coincidence. And, and in fact, when Fort Ontario, when the eventual refugee camp is announced, they call Grafton to thank him um, and, and say, you know, you know that you started this. So Grafton proposes what he calls free ports. You can see that in the first sentence. This idea that um, a free port is basically a, a place where a company will bring in goods and it won't be taxed because it's not considered officially entering the United States. And then once that stuff is here, they can decide what to do with it, either keep it in the United States, at which point it will be taxed or move it to a different country. And so they're proposing that refugees could be like free ports, not officially entering, but kept here until they could go someplace else. And Grafton writes, the refugees, Jewish and other, ask only for a few fenced in acres of the poorest land in America. They don't want to keep it. They just want to sit on it until they can go home again. And radio commentators get involved and start calling for free ports. There's even one radio commentator who gives, um, reads basically an open letter to John Paley saying, it would be so great if our amazing War Refugee Board could have these free ports. It would, it would really help them. And so, dear Mr. Paley, I really hope that you can get this thing. And of course, Paley is the one, Paley and Du Bois are the ones kind of pushing this secretly from behind. And the White House is, is, of course, watching all of this. And they solicit a public opinion poll. And you can see all of the clauses in this poll. Um, it has been proposed that our government offer, offer temporary protection to people who have been persecuted by the Nazis but have escaped, are now homeless and could save themselves by coming here. They will be kept in special camps for the duration of the war, not allowed to have jobs outside the camps. And when the war is over, they will be returning to their native lands. And with those caveats, 71% approve of this. It is clear, though, that Congress is not going to approve. And, and the board's kind of friends in Congress make it really clear that if this goes to any sort of bill, um, that Congress will inevitably vote it down. Roosevelt finally says that he will agree to it. He will agree to one camp and a limit of 1,000 people in that camp if the War Refugee Board can give him an emergency reason to bypass Congress. And almost immediately they find one. They learn that uh, the Allied military, which is fighting its way towards Rome at this point, so you can kind of see about where they were at the 42nd parallel around this time in the spring of 1944, that they are turning away 
boats from people who are escaping Yugoslavia right across the Adriatic and trying to land in the allied part of southern Italy. And the refugee camps in southern Italy were overcrowded. Um, the U.S. military was saying we can't handle all of these people and continue the war effort safely. And so we're turning people away. And so the War Refugee Board gets incredibly upset. This is against, you know, turning refugees away is against um, stated U.S. policy now. And so Morgenthau and Paley go to Roosevelt um, and Roosevelt agrees to allow the creation of this one camp, which he calls an emergency refugee shelter. You can see these are the different names that they gave him to pick from. Station of Safety, Liberation Camp, War Victim Shelter. And he picked Emergency Refugee Shelter because he said this con this connotates or connotes the temporary character of the refugees' stay in the United States. He announces this to Congress right after D-Day. Uh, he sends the message on June 8th, the official message to Congress that the United States is going to create a shelter for refugees. Um, this comes only a couple of days also after the liberation of Rome. And so Roosevelt finally tells the War Refugee Board that they can go ahead and secure a camp in the United States. Um, a few locations are floated, including Jerome, Arkansas, which had been a camp for Japanese Americans um, in Arkansas. And ultimately, Roosevelt doesn't think Arkansas is a good choice, but suggests New York. And um, particularly... Uh, is very happy when the War Department comes back and says that there is a military barracks or military installation that has just been decommissioned in the town of Oswego um, called Fort Ontario. And Roosevelt, who had um, campaigned in the summer uh, when he was running for governor and for earlier office, he had campaigned in Oswego. So he remembered it and said that the weather is very good there, which if you know every anything about upstate New York, um, this is just north of Syracuse on Lake Ontario. That is not true at all. Um, but Roosevelt had only ever been there during the summer. And so this is a um, an Oswego kind of Chamber of Commerce brochure from 1942. And I like the tagline here because it's Oswego, why not here? Um, and so it's a very fitting tagline here. And so, as I said, three days after D-Day, Roosevelt announces the creation of the Fort Ontario shelter. Um, within a week, the Oswego Chamber of Commerce, and I want to point out that the town does not know that this is about to happen. Um, they find out when they read about it in the newspaper. And the town committee, the special Fort Ontario committee that is being set up, um, writes to Roosevelt to thank him for choosing them, to say that we assure you of the deep appreciation of Oswegonians and of our willingness at all times to cooperate with our government in the vast problems that confront it. Fort Ontario, an institution of Oswego, Mr. President, will continue to measure up to its worthy tradition. The Fort Ontario Emergency Refugee Shelter opens um, at 7.30 a.m. on Saturday, August 5th, 1944. As you can see, the overnight train kind of hugging the shores of Lake Ontario and pulling into the camp. Um, the waiting newsreel crews, as you can see, uh, you can see the military police handing up milk uh, to the newly arrived refugees. Um, stretchers are carrying some of the people who had fallen ill on the voyage. Um, they represent 18 different nationalities. There are 982 refugees who come. And many of them are wearing tags around their necks. I don't know if you can see that in this footage. Um, tags are, yeah, you can kind of see it in the middle there and, and definitely here. Um, those tags identify them as army transport casual baggage. Um, the youngest of the refugees, uh, Harry Marr, had been born um, on, a, on a truck on the way to the dock um, before the ship sailed. And the eldest, Isaac Cohen, had been born in Thessalonica during the American Civil War. And so they represent this huge range of experiences. And, and really the only thing they had in common is that they all had found themselves in Allied occupied Southern Italy at the right time in September 19, or in um, the summer of 1944. And they had all signed documents saying that they would return to Europe after the war, although some of them didn't remember doing it. And some of them didn't do it until the ship had literally sailed um, and they were leaving Europe. 
as I said, Du Bois was not really involved in the day-to-day -day operations um, after the first few months, though, as I said, I think he gets a lot of credit for being kind of the moral voice behind the call for Fort Ontario and, and in doing so changed thousands and thousands of lives, not just the refugees who came, but since they were allowed to stay, all of their descendants. And almost every time I give a talk, somebody in the crowd is a descendant or knows somebody who is at Fort Ontario. Um, and, and you add that to the tens of thousands of people whose lives were either saved or affected by the War Refugee Board. Um, he, when he gets involved with the board, because he does pop up here and here and there as they kind of call him back in, it's always because they need someone to be that strong voice, uh, to help his friends and push them to be bolder than they thought they could be. So a complaint against um, uh, the State Department continuing to delay work with the War Refugee Board, um, Du Bois in the spring of 1944 leaks uh, what the State Department is doing to Drew Pearson, who was the most feared gossip columnist in Washington. Um, there was a lot of discussion at the time that I found in my research over whether it had been Du Bois. Like everybody was pretty sure that he's the only one kind of with the gumption to, to leak to um, Drew Pearson. But then uh, again, when I was up looking through Kane's files, they have some draft memoirs from Du Bois, and you can see that he has X'd out of his memoir, this was my first meeting with Drew Pearson. <laughs> I decided something more than normal was needed to get action. And so confirmation here that Du Bois was in fact uh, the War Refugee Board's leak. And he did that a couple of times over the course of the war. And none of this is surprising once you read or learn anything about Josiah Du Bois. Um, when the war ended and Truman, the, there was rumors that the War Refugee Board was going to shut down. And Du Bois, of course, comes right back into the fray and says, and this is a direct quote, that he will knife any plans to shut down the War Refugee Board. Um, but Truman ultimately ordered their work to end. And so the War Refugee Board ceased to exist on September 15th, 1945. Um, by 1947, uh, du Bois is back in private practice in New Jersey, but soon he would be back in government and he would make it to Germany. Um, he had been able to tour the American occupied zone in 1946 and went back for a much longer period in 1947 as a prosecutor. Um, when people think of war crimes trials, they're generally thinking of the International Military Tribunal, the so-called Nuremberg trial, which was when Hermann Goering and a lot of the big official Nazis are tried. But the United States stayed in Nuremberg and had a number of subsequent trials and Kane's collection from Du Bois of kind of the inner workings of some of these subsequent trials is, is such a goldmine for historians. And I'm really excited for people to really get into um, what Du Bois is doing there and what we can learn from these subsequent trials. Um, you can see him kind of in the middle, right under the middle arrow pointing to the eight. Um, Du Bois was a prosecutor for trial number six, which was the trial against the Einsatzgruppen, um, the German chemical company that utilized prisoner labor and was also infamously manufactured Zyklon B, the poison gas pellets that were used at Auschwitz. Um, you can see him here in his prosecutorial role. And then my favorite photo of him um, is a candid photo. This was taken by one of the other prosecutors and in the caption on the back of the photo, it said that Du Bois had just peed in the Rhine River and because he wanted to make sure that he left his mark. And I, I think that is kind of a summary of Du Bois generally, um, that he was appalled by what the Nazis were doing and that he was going to make his mark um, in, in making it stop. And so... I hope that, you know, although the United States could have done so much more to aid Jews and other Nazi victims, especially in the 1930s, what Josiah Du Bois does matters. Um, he has a huge mark on this history um, and is really someone who, who is a hero in this history. Uh, I have talked for a very long time, some would say long enough. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear from you if you want to put questions in the chat. Um, we can we can talk about anything that you all want to talk about. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And then um, 
if you if you want to say something, feel free to unmute. I think there's a few enough of us that that's okay. Um, and it's nice to see so many friends uh, here in the audience. So thanks for sticking with me. Thank you. Um, and so I'm going to ask that anyone with a question, please feel free to um, raise your hand or unmute or put your question in the chat. We have about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Andy. Yes, hi. Hi. I live in Toronto. I am a young child Holocaust survivor, and I'm a member of a Jewish motorcycle club who had their meeting in Oswego about four years ago. I was there. Wow. What yeah. a small... Which club are you with? Yowies, Yidden on Wheels in Toronto. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't get one of your patches, but I got one from the Guns and Moses. I have well, a little collection of Jewish motorcycle patches. You well, guys did great work. That was an incredible event. It was. It was unbelievable. But one of my questions is, when we were there, we were told that it was Mrs. Roosevelt who made all that. And originally, it was a quota of a thousand. So what you said right now, I got to congratulate you. What you have done from memory was just unbelievable. But please try to explain the original quota of 1,000, what happened to it. And then, of course, there was also quite a bit of controversy about the uh, local people, yes. if you have the time. Sure, of course. Yeah, so so Franklin Roosevelt is the one who puts the cap at 1,000. Um, 982 ultimately come, and then um, with the series of births and deaths, there's ultimately about um, 1,012 refugees who ultimately live at Fort Ontario. There were more births than deaths. Eleanor um, famously visits the refugees in September 1944, um, it's one of the most memorable things that the refugees talk about is the visit of the First Lady and Eleanor Morgenthau, Helen, uh, Henry Morgenthau's wife. They come for the day, they see the refugees who put on a performance for them, and then Eleanor walks away and really becomes a champion for them. Um, she works to allow some of the older refugees uh, to attend college. Um, before it had been that kids could attend public school, but but the refugees who were older teenagers were not allowed to attend the local college. Mrs. Roosevelt really changes that. Um, and then there is a lot of kind of controversy. By and large, the town I think is quite welcoming, but as in any town, um, there are people who spread rumors about what's happening you know, behind the barbed wire of the camp saying that the refugees are getting better treatment, better food, um, you know, that these these refugees don't have to work and that sort of thing. And the town newspaper, thankfully, the publisher of the newspaper was very supportive of the shelter and even started um, a column in the newspaper uh, specifically to dispel rumors about what was happening in inside the shelter. Um, and so very soon, you know, there's a local townsperson who starts the Boy Scout troop when Congress finally starts to investigate what's going on at the fort, um, you know, trying to decide whether we are actually, whether the United States is actually going to send these people back to Europe, um, 14 members of the Oswego community, including primary school teachers, the principal of the elementary school, the middle school and the high school, the chief of police, they all testify about what good people these refugees are and how they should be allowed to stay. Um, so it it really is a, a pretty, I think, amazing story. Um, this is actually, I, this is the book that I'm working on now is the story of the refugees at Fort Ontario. And my first trip up there was with um, the Jewish motorcycle, the Jewish motorcyclists. Um, I don't have my hat here. I, I have it like in the other room. Um, in, but in that case, a... in that case, let me in, extend an official invitation to you, because <laughs> the next R two R right to remember will be here in Toronto, June of next year. Okay. And and I'm on the organizing committee. I'd love to have you as a speaker it if we could great. arrange it. Yeah, if we can arrange it, it would be great to come. So for those of you who don't know, the the ride to remember is. 
um, the Ju Jewish Motorcyclists Alliance, and every year they ride to remember and they go to a Holocaust related site and raise money for the site. And it's it's incredible people, a great, great fun party and um, a lot of like good work being done. So I'm I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, I'll reserve a seat on a motorcycle okay. for you. <laughs> I would love that. Um, there I will make of, that connection. Thank okay. you. There are a couple of places, uh, questions in the chat that I want to make sure that we get to and, and be aware of the time. Yeah. I just want to say, Andy, you don't remember me, but I remember you and I remember your mother. Wow. Um, from Toronto. And I began my career when I was an intern at the Holocaust Center more than 20 years ago. My goodness. What and a small world. was one of the first people that I met when I was there. And so I was very excited and actually told Becky, I'm like, I know who this is before the program. So it's wonderful. And I want to come to that also. So I'm going to yeah. follow. <laughs> we'll have a good time. Great. Um, uh, so there's a question about the woman involved in the camp. You're thinking of Ruth Gruber, uh, who was working for the Department of the Interior and went to Europe to um, be on the ship with the refugees, really to kind of prep stories for the American press to make sure that you know, they the when the refugees arrived, the press could understand some of the stories of what the refugees had been through. It was a kind of a propaganda thing. But they fall in love with her, she falls in love with them, and then she also becomes a huge champion for um the the refugees at the fort. Mordecai, hi Mordecai, um, hi. asks about financing the board. Um, so Roosevelt gives them a set num set amount of money. It it starts at a million dollars, and then for a couple of different projects, including the food packages, that that is also federal money, but coming from a different budgeting account. And so normally people say, "Oh, the War Refugee Board got a million dollars." They actually got more than that. It ends up being about three million, but it's tagged for things for specific projects. A lot of the things that the board is doing is really trying to streamline things for other organizations. And so the joint, for example, has a pretty large budget for the time, but doesn't have the ability to actually spend the money. And what the board does is it facilitates, um, clears the decks so that the joint can do their projects in Europe. And so a lot of what the board is doing is not so much um, spending their own money. It's helping all of these organizations finally be able to spend theirs. And so... They are not necessarily funding the board's work, though the joint does make some donations and Hyas actually gives some money to the board too. Um, but the board is kind of trying to be a microphone for all of these other organizations. Um, let's see. Did the State Department play a role in the refusal to bomb the train lines? I don't think so. That's a War Department thing. Um, there's no evidence that the War Department actually seriously ever investigates whether it was feasible. And we now know that the planes, that American planes taking off from Foggia were flying around Auschwitz because they're bombing um, the IG Farben plants, actually. Uh, but the State Department doesn't have a role in, in that decision. Um, du Bois was never awarded Righteous Among the Nations. Mordecai can talk to this. But the, the criteria is that you have to um, risk your life. And so there are very few Americans that fall into that category, in part because um, Americans have the protection of diplomats up to a certain point and in certain locations. And Du Bois, during the war, does not leave the U.S. Um, he actually he does go with Morgenthau to France in the fall of 1944 and to England, but he is not um, he is not in his life is not in danger for saving Jews. Um, let's see. Um, the, Wallenberg's disappearance and whether the U.S. played a role in trying to pressure the Soviets to have him released. Um, kind of a little bit more so after we now think um, Wallenberg died um, or Wallenberg had been killed. So there is a little bit of diplomatic pressure in 1947. Um, once it became clear that he was missing and his family, the Dardens, start um, kind of um, promoting his story and pressuring the U.S. government. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt writes a column, Dorothy Thompson writes a column, but a lot of the big kind of diplomatic moves come in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, Ingrid Carlberg's book on Wallenberg is really the best one, both as a biography, it's, it's really big, 
but it's kind of half a biography um, until his death. And then it's everything that happened after his death. Um, that is the book that I would recommend um, for Wallenberg. If you want a very quick summary of it or quick, um, I gave a lecture for the University of Michigan specifically about Wallenberg. It's called the Bellin Lecture. It's one of their yearly series. And I talked about the War Refugee Board's relationship specifically with Wallenberg and then a bit about what happened after he died. And so um, that should be online too. But Ingrid Carlberg is the is the scholar to look at here. Um, can, I, can I add something? Yeah, of course, about please. Wallenberg? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, when I worked at Yad Vashem, uh, I received a uh, communication uh, from uh, the Israeli ambassador in Moscow uh, when uh, he was not yet the ambassador, but he was a, was a diplomatic representative. That was in 1991. And he told me that uh, he had uh, been told by a former officer in the KGB, uh, an important person, uh, that uh, Wallenberg uh, had been put to death upon orders by Beria, mm. uh, and that it, it happened when uh, when Beria realized that he had made a mistake in having uh, Wallenberg arrested, and he was afraid Stalin was still alive. This is 1951, Stalin was still alive, and he was afraid to tell Stalin that he had uh, really embarrassed the Soviet Union, and Stalin would, would have retaliated very strong against Beria. And so yeah. he decided uh, to have him eliminated uh, yeah. in one way or another. And I was told, uh, if you want to come to Moscow and speak to the, the KGB officer, uh, uh, I'm not going to disclose his name, he said, uh, but if you come, uh, then you can talk to him and he can give you more information. But uh, be aware uh, that for security reasons, we're not responsible for your safety when you come to Moscow. Please. and speak uh, to that KGB officer, you know, it's on your own. That was in 1991 in August, and I decided not to go. Yeah. But I, I gave this information, I gave it out to Yad Vashem, that uh, this information that uh, Wallenberg did not die, but he was executed upon orders uh, from Beria, and the whole thing was silence. So uh, this is the information that I had. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of Carlberg. Carlberg actually gets it to kind of a general date, but it's it's an execution. Um, I've always heard, and there's evidence in the War Refugee Board papers, I think, of this and in some of the Wallenberg stuff, that one of the reasons that he was picked up, that he was actually arrested, was um, his relationship with Ivor Olsen, the War Refugee Board's representative in Sweden who had hired him. Olson was a member of the OSS and oh, had right. been and, yeah, and had right. been working to get people out of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, including anti-Soviet um, people and politicians and officials and, and that sort of thing, and get them kind of illegally into Sweden. And um, pro-Soviet papers, communist papers in Sweden, had specifically called out somebody in the U.S. embassy as funding this operation. And that was in the weeks before Wallenberg disappeared. And so there there's some indication that, you know, if the Soviets were trying to make ties, it would not have been hard for them to tie Olson to Wallenberg um, and then assume incorrectly uh, that Wallenberg himself was OSS. There's no evidence that Wallenberg was OSS. But, and that he was that he was planted. He was sent yeah. to actually planted in Hungary uh, yeah. to avoid Hungary falling with, uh, within the Soviet sphere. Correct. And he was actually an American agent, and yes. that his rescue operation was mer merely a cover. Yes, for, correct. For, that's what they thought then. Yeah, yeah. But Carl Carl Berg's book is is for something that is nine hundred pages. It's surprisingly readable and quite good. I thought. Okay. Thank you. Um. Uh, Joe just had a quick question about the motivation for Du Bois. Do we ever hear him in his papers talk about what takes such extraordinary action? Um, I think the thing that comes through in a lot of the War Refugee Board papers and the, a lot of the things that they wrote afterwards and interviews that they gave is that they saw the United States as a force for good in the world. And they did not believe any of this um, we must win the war and the only way we can win the war is to focus 100% of our attention on winning the war. This kind of thing that the State Department was doing and that other branches of the government was doing, 
um, the Treasury Department really saw themselves as yes and people. We can do that, but we also need for our own kind of to live up to our values and our rhetoric by taking this action. You know, we need to be who we say we are. And you you had a group of people who were quite young and idealistic and did not come from the kind of blue blood black background that so many other people in, in Washington did. And so that's, I think, a lot of their motivation. And I think Du Bois is probably also motivated by Louis, his brother, who's, who's a POW at this point, um, to say, you know, I want people under Nazi control <laughs> to, to be treated well. And this was his small way of being able to, to do that. Um, Louis certainly in a di completely different category than people who are um, being targeted by the Nazis for racial and religious reasons. But I, I have to think that his sympathy, you know, he's attuned to this in a different kind of way, if that yes. makes sense. If it's okay to just piggyback on that, yeah. does he like understand how extraordinary what he did was, though, or is he like underplay it later? Because you hear from a lot of people who kind of like, you know, I did what anyone would have done in this situation, but like, not really. You know, you know what I, I mean? mean? Like, do Du Bois was the guy who peed in the Rhine. Like, he was he was a bit of more of a showman, I think, than some of the others in the War Refugee Board, and he was more willing to talk to reporters and to give oral histories than some of the others were. Um, I think there are certain interviews where his wife Dorothy comes in and then she kind of becomes his hype man. And it's like, remember when you did this? Remember when you like she's very proud of him and rightfully so. Um, but I think he was he was um, of the war refugee board people more willing to talk than others. But I still think the fact that so many people still don't know about the war refugee board shows that, um, you know, he, he didn't brag enough in comparison to what they actually did. Thank you everybody for coming. This was great. Excellent. And thank you so much, Becky, as always, um, for joining us and for illuminating this history that I think is largely misunderstood or not understand through a critical enough lens. So thank you for doing that. Um, again, thank you again to Union County um, for supporting this work. This is the third year in a row that the Holocaust Resource Center has received um, financial support from the county to work on this collection and the materials around it. So thank you so much to everyone for being here and we look forward to seeing you soon. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.